tonight on CBC Vancouver News. It is a choice to be immunized, but there are consequences for people who are not immunized. The last push, how the province is trying to vaccinate the unvaccinated and fast also. An evacuation order has been issued by the local government. Please heed those warnings. Please heed those times. BC wildfire crews get help with more stable weather, but they face new challenges from people and in the long run, they won't be able to grow. Why Metro Vancouver's trees are at risk. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, thanks for joining us. The next two weeks are being called pivotal for BC's vaccination program. The province is focusing on people who are still unvaccinated and trying to make it as easy as possible. Susanna De Silva has more on whether BC will have special rules for people who don't get the shots. We aren't there yet. We have more work to do. More work to do to convince the 20% of British Columbians who still haven't received their first dose of a COVID vaccine to get one. The vast majority of them will get vaccinated. They want to get vaccinated, but you have to make it convenient. You, you've got to make it fun. As for convenient, the province says they will be offering more walk-in vaccination clinics, highlighted by Walk-In Wednesday on August 4th when 20,000 doses will be available with no appointment needed. As for fun, they'll be aiming for smaller and mobile clinics to go to places like beaches. Officials believe the percentage of those who will likely never get a vaccine regardless of convenience is small. For COVID vaccine, our studies have shown us that it's maybe as, as many as 5% of people. But that's a very small percent. They tend to be very organized and very vocal, especially on social media. They are also asking family doctors to be part of the program by reassuring any patients who are still hesitating. This doctor was recently able to convince an entire family after a 45-minute conversation. There were some things that they had read in social media and it was taking the time to tease out those concerns. She believes making vaccines more accessible would help some of her patients. If I showed up at their door today with a shot, they'd take it. It's just that they couldn't get out of work or they couldn't get to a clinic. As for consequences of not getting vaccinated, officials say there will be in venues like healthcare settings where unvaccinated will be subject to extra testing, but it will be up to businesses and events to mandate if they choose. Putting yourself close to big groups of people is expanding that risk to other people. So no, I, I personally feel that there, there should be limitations. A push would be good. You know, if you can take all barriers away, then we may get there, but I don't ever think we'll ever get 95%. And some have already found an international motivator. I definitely know a couple of my friends have decided to get the vaccine just for traveling purposes. So I definitely think it depends on what you want to do in the future. Northern Health has the highest percentage of unvaccinated in the province at over 32 percent, while 78 percent of those in hospital in B.C. with COVID are unvaccinated. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. BC recorded 150 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. Interior Health is still the hotspot with 95 of the new cases there. 44 people are in hospital with 22 in intensive care. Thankfully, no one has died from the disease in the past day. Now, even though the province is pushing reopening, rising case numbers are a concern. A growing number of restaurants, bars and resorts in Kelowna, for example, have closed because of COVID exposures. Outbreaks amongst staff have forced businesses to shut their doors. Venues like B&A Brewing, Central, Rusty Sports Lounge and Gotham are all closed. These restaurants are urging customers to stay away until safety procedures are reviewed and they can reopen safely. Wildfire crews are getting some help from the weather as they battle massive blazes across BC, but they're running into other problems, people. The BC Wildfire Service says they're seeing a more stable weather pattern this week with less lightning and fewer fire starts. That's good news as more than 250 wildfires burn. It means massive blazes will burn steadily, not fueled and spread by wind. But more stable weather means the smoke will linger, hurting air quality and slowing down aircraft. Officials say smoke is set to clear out around Friday, along with a rise in temperatures. The other problem, staff say they've had to divert helicopters and aircraft to help people who did not follow evacuation orders. I am aware of at least three situations where we had to divert our resources 
um, either on the ground or in the air to assist with evacuating people that got caught behind um, the fire line and oh. their evacuation route or their escape route uh, was cut off. Schweitzer says even seasoned firefighters are facing fire behavior in conditions they've never experienced. So people need to leave if they've ordered, been ordered to. Experts now say the fires in Western Canada are generating their own weather systems because of the intense heat and drought conditions. And the swaths of the interior burn dozens of Vancouver Island firefighters are answering the call to help. Just this morning, a crew for, from Courtney headed out, and so did two from Oyster River. Um, fires on the side of the road, you're driving through it. Um, hydro poles burn to the ground. Um, there's pretty much fire to the left, to the right, in front, behind, uh, almost everywhere we went. Baum just finished an eight-day rotation near Cache Creek. His team protected up to 100 homes while he was there. They say the experience will also help equip them for the possibility of wildfires on the island. Now it appears BC's blistering heat dome was even more deadly than first thought. Our coroner now says nearly 100 more people died during that record heat wave. The number now sits at 815, up from 719. More than 40% of those deaths happened in the Fraser Health region, and around 24% were in coastal health. The 815 sudden deaths is more than quadruple the average over the past five years. Important to note, though, the number of those deaths that are specifically related to heat is still not yet clear. Seniors were among the hardest hit, and with temperatures heading back into the 30s, the seniors advocate is calling on loved ones to step up. Go and check on people, get the cool cloths on them, get the cool liquids into them, get them into a cool shower if you can. The province is asking all British Columbians to take precautions this week with the heat warning in effect for most of BC. The worst of it is expected from tomorrow through Saturday. Meanwhile, air quality advisories are up throughout the interior. This is the view in Kamloops right now. Smoke hiding the he views of the hills north of the city and residents reporting ash and dusting the streets, cars and homes. It's been that way for several days. The air quality index sits at 10 plus, very high. Similar conditions are in the Okanagan and in Castlegar. Children, seniors and people with asthma, heart or lung issues are urged to be very careful. Today marks 41 straight days without a drop of rain falling at Vancouver Airport. And the dry conditions are putting local trees at risk. As Eva Yuguen Senj reports, some are worried the streak could last several more weeks. Bone dry, yellow and thirsty. We had a dry spring and then we've had a dry summer. Metro Vancouver parks have been in need of a good rainstorm since June 15. We need a lot of precipitation to catch up and doesn't look like we're going to get a whole lot of it, at least not in the near term. Dry summers are typical on the south coast and local trees and plants are well adapted to a July and August without rain. But what's not normal, the early start to the dry spell and that's left some trees struggling. If they just can't maintain their enough water to keep their cells alive, then the cells will die, perhaps the plant will die. In the long run, they won't be able to grow because they won't be able to photosynthesize. Young and isolated trees are being hit the hardest, so cities are doubling down on watering, and residents are encouraged to chip in. If they have a chance to drag a hose, and uh, especially on younger trees, and let the hose trickle for quite a long time, every you know, week or twice a week. Most trees will survive this dry season, but the stress will affect them for years to come. Branches that were alive this year might just die, die back next year. So the stress that our trees are living through now has impact that compounds over the years. It's another example of the dangerous cycle of climate change. We rely on forests to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, but when they die, trees release more carbon than they take up. If we are relying on that nature-based solution uh, to climate change, we need to slow climate change to a pace that nature can keep up. Vancouver's official drought record is 58 days, and given the sunny forecast for the next few weeks, a new record could be well within reach. Eva Yuguen Senj, CBC News, Vancouver. The worries about drought are especially high on Vancouver Island, where several areas have started drying up already. The one-time rapids-filled stretch of the Chimanus River here is down to a trickle. Extremely low flows and growing gravel banks from erosion are nearly drying it up. The province warns several rivers and creeks are at risk.
Conditions have been kind of carrying on, and what we've been noticing is they're kind of they're getting a little more dramatic, so kind of a little more volatile. Meanwhile, Cowichan Tribes is removing tons of gravel and log jams from the Coxilla and Cowichan Rivers. Low water flows and debris increase the temperature of the water for salmon. And even more alarming is that we're still in July. August tends to be Vancouver Island's driest months. Johanna is off this week, so meteorologist Colette Kennedy joins us now. Colette, heat-wise, how high will it get in B.C.? Thanks, Dan. Well, we can take a look at the special weather statement that's been issued and talk about where these numbers are going to go with our daytime highs and these maximums. Not likely to be the record-setting heat that we had seen back several weeks ago, but we're still seeing some changes in the pattern. So for the south coast, we're talking high 20s to actually even some low 30s and expected interior of Vancouver Island, that Sea to Sky uh, corridor where we'll see some of the higher numbers there inland. Certainly, that's where we get into the interior Southern Ontario, mid 30s to upper 30s in terms of those daytime highs, really peaking towards Friday and Saturday. It'll linger a little longer with that heat Sunday into that Southern Interior. But uh, as we look at what's happening with our satellite and radar imagery, what's happening? Not much. We know that high pressure in play, dry conditions persisting. And as we see that ridge actually building in and this sort of seesaw, uh, that we have in terms of heat in the west and cooler of below seasonal temperatures in the east, we may begin to get into a little bit of an outflow with the winds too. So that could push some of the air quality issues out towards the coast and the island, but that'll certainly be something we're watching for now. The statements are still in place there. I do want to give you, well, at least a glimmer of hope, but this is more towards the interior. Uh, we'll kind of take it anywhere we could get some rain. I've stopped this Sunday in the morning hours. As we go towards the later evening and even into Monday, we could see some wet conditions. That's not a widespread soaking rain. That's just how that model looks, but even some wet conditions coming through. Like I said, we'll take whatever we could get, right? Uh, into tomorrow morning, 17 after a low of 15. Tomorrow, 26, but look out inland up to 30 degrees. And we're really watching towards Friday, Saturday, where we're going to be peaking more towards the Metro Vancouver area. And uh, we're certainly going to be seeing some of those temperatures with those low 30s, but those high 30s, like I said, as you get into the southern interior uh, for Vancouver through the period, dry conditions, Dan. Okay, thanks very much, Colette. Three years after a landslide along the Fraser River decimated salmon numbers, the Big Bar Landslide Response is reporting early salmon returns that are the strongest in years. After uh, a disastrous year in 2019 and a disastrous year in 2020 for different reasons, um, but this year we are seeing uh, those salmon get by the slide site. So. With improvements to the fishway, there is clear passage for Chinook and sockeye salmon migration. So far, there have been more than 79,000 salmon seen upstream, but wildfires and rock instability have upended work for a 2022 fishway delivery. Still, DFO is monitoring the promising salmon returns to see if less intensive plans will be needed. To other news now, police say the body of a man found in a burned-out truck in Langley last week was linked to the Lower Mainland gang conflict. Homicide investigators believe 36-year-old Christopher Roy was targeted. Police found Roy's body inside a burnt-out Ford F-150 at 82nd Avenue and 197th Street. Investigators say Roy was known to them and he had a criminal record. Anyone with information about his death is asked to contact IHIT or Crime Stoppers. As Team Canada continues to collect medals at the Tokyo Games, some welcome news also came today for athletes here in B.C. whose Olympic dreams were stalled by COVID-19. 72 amateur sports leagues will get a financial boost from the province. Our boys go out into the community on a regular basis during the season, and it was close to where, you know, a lot of teams in the BCHL weren't going to survive, and that would have been a real shame. The B.C. government's Amateur Sports League Fund is giving out one-time grants worth $11 million. The grants will go to teams that suffered big financial losses from the pandemic. They can use money to hire volunteers, buy equipment, and get more staff. An art dealer from the Fraser Valley has admitted to using a false identity to sell phony Indigenous art. Wood carvings fraudulently signed as Harvey John were selling for more than $100 in famous B.C. gift shops and in galleries. Indigenous artists started asking around and soon discovered there is no Harvey John. 
The museums have now removed the knockoffs and are offering a refund to customers who bought them. You can read much more on this story from our Bethany Lindsay on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Well, the summer of heat, record heat, droughts and wildfires has some communities worried about their future water supply. That's why people near the dry village of Clinton are sounding the alarm over a proposed water bottling plant in their area. As John Hernandez tells us, environmentalists are calling on the province to better protect that precious resource. The rain doesn't fall often in Clinton, B.C. The dry, semi-desert village sees just a couple dozen centimeters a year. Pretty bone dry. Um, most of our vegetation is grass. Greg Crooks is a natural resource manager for the High Bar First Nation, which is in a fight against a proposed water bottling plant. If they need water, um, go to the place where the water exists. Don't go to the driest, uh, some of the driest places in B.C. The plant would draw from an aquifer in the traditional High Bar First Nation lands. The company behind it, Clinton Hong Yang Zeng Hong, wants to extract nearly 1 million litres daily and export it abroad. It's like the ranchers need the water, the First Nations, the people need the water, animals need the water there. The application has been in motion since 2015, but in that time, the First Nation says the landscape has changed drastically through heat, drought, and the infamous 2017 Elephant Hill wildfire that scorched parts of the watershed. This year, there are even more fires in the area, raising concerns about damage to the soil and whether the aquifer can regenerate. Until there is a guarantee that it will not cause issues down the road, you know, our water's not for sale. There are at least eight active applications for bottling plants like this in communities across BC. You need to reevaluate what kind of uh, uses of water do we permit in British Columbia. This environmental law advocate says her office has heard concerns from countless British Columbians. Her office has submitted a proposal to the province calling for a moratorium on all new bottling licenses. It seems like there is a disconnect between overall provincial policy that allows water bottling and other uses and the actual ecosystem conditions that are going on right now in certain areas. The province says it's still reviewing the Clinton plant and it will continue to consult with First Nations. But for now, a moratorium isn't in the cards. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the Tokyo Olympics are on and CBC is home to those games. That means some changes to our programming this week and next. A half-hour edition of our newscast will be on CBC TV at 3 p.m. with Anita Bath Monday to Friday. Then at 6 p.m. we'll stream this 30-minute edition on CBC Gem, Facebook and YouTube, as well as our website with yours truly. Our late and weekend newscasts are taking a break throughout the games. You can always find our latest news programs and news online at cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is on the early edition on CBC Radio 1. That begins tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. Good night. Enjoy the Olympics. If we could, yeah, it'd be great. Thanks very much. Is that okay, Carmen? Don't need fonts. We'll let them put them in. Yeah, because it'll be a different format for an end. Yeah. <clears throat>